The story of Robert Browning's My Last Duchess starts here in Italy. In fact, the poem was named Italy when it was first written. This is a poem that was written in response to a specific event, namely Robert Browning's holiday to the north of Italy that he took as a young man in his 20s. Throughout all of Browning's poetry, he was inspired by places he'd visit and stories that he's heard. And while he didn't exactly visit Ferrara, he visited a lot of places around it. It's therefore only reasonable to assume that one of the stories he heard was how the Duke of Ferrara poisoned his wife. But to really understand Robert Browning, we have to go back a little bit further. We in fact have to go back to South London, not a huge distance from where I'm filming today. We have to go back to Clerkenwell, where Browning was born. His dad was a clerk for the Bank of England and owned a very eclectic, esoteric library of books. Robert did attend school as a young man, but mostly he educated himself at home from his dad's library. He was reading biographies of 12th century rabbis. He was reading stories of ancient Roman alchemists. And these sort of things really fired up his imagination. He loved Blake and Shelley. Because his family were what was called non-conformists, like William Blake was, they didn't belong to the Church of England. When Browning was 18, he attended the University of London, which now includes UCL and LSE and King's and any number of fantastic institutions. But when he joined, he was part of the very first cohort. However, further education was not for Robert and he dropped out after a term. He was an incredibly intellectual and educated man. He was very brusque and very direct. Someone like Keats, we have an intense amount of letters written about him, by him, to him. Browning, we don't. His poetry comes across as being from a man of many, many words, and indeed Browning had an intense vocabulary. But person to person, he was very abrupt. He also had a huge temper and was likely to go off, on, go off at someone if they insulted him. He also kind of assumed everyone was as educated as he was and liked the same things he did. So he would try to engage you in the conversation about 9th century Italian politics and then was perpetually disappointed when the person didn't agree with him. <laughs> An important place to think about in his upbringing though is the Dulwich Picture Gallery in South London. He loved riding his horse over the fields to Dulwich and even though we can get between them on the bus nowadays, it was quite an exciting country ride. One of the artists he enjoyed was called Fra Angelico. And it's not a stretch to see him as an early model for Fra Pandolf from our poem. Browning tried out lots of different careers before he settled on being a poet. The first one he tried was being a playwright. He wrote a set of dramas based on the British, the English Civil War. And they were widely criticised for being incredibly wordy and perhaps more deep than the average person would enjoy. They were performed on the stage, but the production only ran for five days before one of the actors ran away. So we will never really know what what would have come of that. He tried for a little bit to be a secretary in the diplomatic service but after one mission it didn't really work out for him either. It was on this holiday to Italy then 
that he really got his inspiration. The best fit for a potential duke is Alphonse II of Ferrara, born in 1553 and died in 1597. He is not quite the sociopathic evil duke of the poem. He was a soldier. He was in the service of the French king. He was a patron of the arts and now it's widely acknowledged that he brought about a golden age of culture for his small kingdom of Ferrara. However, his first wife is the most likely candidate for our duchess. Her name was Lucrezia de Medici. She was 13 when she married him. The Duke was 25. And while this is a little bit young, this is not one of the most dramatic gaps you will have seen in medieval Italian marriages. She died two years after their marriage. Poison was suspected at the time and Browning probably heard that story. However, modern scholars think that she most likely died of tuberculosis. He didn't go shopping for a new wife afterwards straight away either. He in fact waited four years. He then married a woman who would only have been slightly younger than him at 26. When she died, he went for wife number three as well. Now, this isn't the Duke being horrible and wife shopping. Well, it, it might have been, but it probably wasn't. He was the ruler of an important kingdom that was between the Papal States in Rome, which were owned by the Pope, and the Kingdom of Florence. He needed to have a dynasty in order to keep his kingdom in his family. He needed to have children. Marriages were a great way to build up alliances with people as well. His first wife was a Medici, part of the intense banking family based in Venice. His second wife was Austrian which was probably another alliance with another powerful kingdom. He had to have these alliances in order to keep his power base. Of course, there's an irony in there. The Duke in the poem boasts about his 900 year old name. And in fact, the family de Este would die with the Duke of Ferreira because he, did nev he never had any children in his whole life. He was very interested in certain types of choirs specifically the ones with songs sung by neutered young men called castrati. It's believed by some that because he was interested in these young men and the fact he didn't have children might have meant he was homosexual, but this is just modern speculation. Back to our poem. This poem wouldn't be published for a long time after it was written. Along with a collection of other poems which are just sort of laid around on his desk, they were published in a book called Dramatic Monologues, including Porphyria's Lover. This was the moment at which Browning became famous, and he became famous for his monologues where a character speaks directly to the audience, expressing their innermost thoughts. Shakespeare uses them all the time. Look at Iago's ones in Othello, for instance. But Browning's monologues were a little bit different. Browning's monologues were half drama in their own right and half poetry. His use of language in creating a character was something completely original at this time. And it was the success of dramatic monologues that brought him 
attention in the mainstream. Much like a lot of the other poets in our collection, he would go on to become incredibly influential and famous, but not when he sat down in Italy to write it. And it's very, very easy to imagine the young Browning sitting at a cafe, scribbling away, writing a spooky story about a duke. There's another postscript to this story as well. It was Browning's poetry that first attracted the attention of his wife, Elizabeth, before they were married. She wrote him a fan letter saying how much she loved all of his poetry and asking for some tips for her own poetry or asking for his point of view on things. Browning was more than happy to oblige and after a long courtship, which will be the subject of another video, I promise. After a long courtship, they married. And that was where this story comes full circle. Italy was always Robert and Elizabeth's spiritual home. And once they'd left England, because their marriage was not exactly approved of by her family, they settled in Genoa, moved to Florence, back to Genoa, always staying around the north of Italy. So it was this poem on a trip to Italy, which inspired his wife to write to him, which inspired them to go back to Italy. And there's something so charming about the fact that a poem about a broken love, a poem about a suspicious duke, is what led to one of the most beautiful and happy literary marriages of all time. <laughs>